Naima gave birth to twins, one light-skinned and the other dark-skinned. Tragically, she passed away during childbirth, leaving an unresolved mystery. However, what her husband Kofi discovers later changes his life forever. The general hospital was bustling with activity, but Amma's delivery room was a center of tension and anguish. The young mother clutched the sheets tightly, her eyes closed with determination. Her breathing was erratic, and sweat ran down her forehead. Kofi, her husband, was by her side, holding her hand. He tried to stay strong, but fear and worry were evident on his face. Amma, breathe. Please breathe, murmured Kofi, trying to calm her, though he was on the verge of collapse himself. The contractions grew more intense and frequent. Ayma let out a groan of pain followed by a scream that echoed through the room. Doctor. Mensa, with a focused expression, gave quick instructions to the team of nurses around her. Push, Amma, push with all your strength. They're almost here, said the doctor, trying to keep her voice firm and encouraging. Ayma, panting, nodded with difficulty and gathered what strength she had left. With a final wrenching scream, she brought the first twin into the world. The baby's cry filled the room, but the joy was momentary. Just a minute later, the second twin was born with a strong cry. Kofi watched in astonishment and confusion as the nurses cleaned and wrapped the babies. One of the twins had light skin like Ayama's, while the other had dark skin. Kofi was speechless, his mind trying to process what he was seeing. Before he could ask questions, he noticed something alarming. Ama, are you okay? Ama? Kofi felt panic rising in his throat, as he saw Ama closing her eyes, her breathing becoming increasingly weak. Doctor, something's wrong, shouted Kofi, his voice breaking. Doctor. Mensa immediately focused her attention on Ama, shouting orders to the nurses. Despite their efforts, Ama's life quickly faded away. Kofi knelt beside the bed, holding her hand, tears streaming down his face. Ayama, please hold on. Don't leave me, he whispered, his voice filled with desperation. Ama opened her eyes one last time, looking at him with a mixture of love and sadness. Take care of them, Kofi. Promise me, she murmured before closing her eyes forever. Kofi screamed in pain and anguish, holding Ama as the nurses tried to pull him away. Doctor. Mensa approached with a grave expression. I'm so sorry, Kofi. We did everything we could, she said, placing a hand on his shoulder. Kofi didn't respond, he just stayed there clinging to Ayama. The cries of the twins filled the room, but Kofi couldn't hear them. His world had shattered at that moment. Finally, with indescribable pain, he let the nurses take Ayama away. Hours later, Kofi was sitting in the waiting room, his gaze lost. He couldn't process what had happened. Nana, his mother, arrived in a hurry, her face showing concern. Kofi, what happened? Where's Ama? She asked, but seeing her son's expression, she realized that something terrible had happened. Ama, she couldn't make it. And mom, I don't know what to do. Kofi stammered, tears falling again. Nana hugged him, trying to console him. I'm so sorry, son, we'll get through this. The children need you now, she said, though she knew her words barely touched Kofi's pain. The next day, Kofi went to see the twins. Sitting in a chair next to the incubators, he looked at the two little ones, still unable to believe they were his. One had light skin and the other dark skin. The pain of losing Ayama was still sharp, but now it was mixed with confusion about the babies. Nana, seeing the expression on Kofi's face, approached and put a hand on his shoulder. Kofi, these children need their father. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. They are part of Ayama and part of you. Kofi nodded slowly, but in his heart, the conflict and pain were still present. As he looked at the twins, he knew that his life had changed forever, and that the road ahead would be difficult and full of challenges he could not yet comprehend. Kofi was sitting at the kitchen table, staring at his cup of cold coffee. The house was silent, only the faint cries of the twins could be heard from the next room. Nana, his mother, entered the kitchen and stopped when she saw him in that state. Kofi, you need to eat something, Nana said, her voice full of concern. She knew her son was devastated, but she also knew he had to stay strong for his children. Kofi looked up, his eyes red and lifeless. I'm not hungry, Mom. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know if I can, Kofi replied. Nana sat down next to him, 
taking his hand. I know, son. This is the hardest thing you've ever had to face, but those children need you. Ama needed you and trusted you with their care. But how? How can I take care of them when I'm not even sure they're mine? Kofi's voice broke, one is light-skinned, and the other is dark-skinned. How is that possible? Nana sighed, squeezing Kofi's hand. We can't always understand everything in life, Kofi. But the color of their skin doesn't change the fact that they are your children. I've looked at them. I've seen how they look at you. There is something of you and Ama in them. But if you need to know the truth, you can take a test. But until then, don't reject them. Kofi nodded slowly, but the doubt and pain still persisted in his heart. I can't do it alone, Mom. I need you to take care of them just for a while until I can clear my mind. Nana saw the pain and despair in her son's eyes and knew he was on the verge of a breakdown. Okay, Kofi, I'll take care of them. But remember, they need their father. Don't take too long to come back to them. Kofi stood up, feeling overwhelmed and guilty. Thank you, Mom. I really appreciate it. I need to go out for a while. I need to think. As Kofi left the house, Nana went to the room where the twins were crying. She gently picked them up, one in each arm, and began to rock them softly. Shake, calm down, little ones. Everything will be fine. Grandma is here. Kofi wandered aimlessly through the neighborhood, his thoughts confused and painful. He passed by the mechanic's shop where he worked but didn't feel strong enough to go in. Instead, he headed to a nearby bar, looking to drown his sorrow in alcohol. Kofi, what are you doing here so early? Asked Yaw, his friend and co-worker, who found him at the bar. Yaw sat down next to him, worried to see his friend in such a state. Yaw, I don't know what to do. Ama is dead, and I have two babies at home that I don't know if they're mine. I can't handle this Kofi confessed his voice broken by despair. Yaw put a hand on Kofi's shoulder. I'm so sorry, Kofi. I can't imagine what you're going through. But hiding here won't solve anything. You have to face it. If you need help, we're here for you. Thank you, but I don't know if I can. This is all too much, Kofi replied, his voice barely a whisper. Yaw looked at his friend seriously. Kofi, those children need their father. They need someone to love and take care of them, and you are that person. Take your time, but don't abandon them." Kofi nodded, feeling a bit more understood but still lost. I'm going to try, y'all, but I need time. Thanks for being here. He returned home several hours later, feeling a bit calmer but still overwhelmed. Nana was in the living room, rocking the twins, who had finally calmed down. Kofi stopped at the door, watching the scene. Mom, thank you for everything. I know you're doing more than I should ask of you, Kofi said, his voice filled with gratitude and pain. Nana looked at him tenderly. Kofi, these children need their father. You can't keep running away. Kofi approached and took one of the twins in his arms, feeling a connection he couldn't deny. That night, while the twins slept in the next room, Kofi stayed awake, struggling with his thoughts and emotions. The next day, Nana sat in the rocking chair in the small room holding one of the twins in her arms. The little one looked at her with big, inquisitive eyes. The contrast between the two babies continued to baffle her. The baby in her arms had pale skin and light eyes, while his brother, asleep in the crib, had deep-toned skin and dark eyes. Shay, ch, everything's okay, my love Nana whispered, stroking the baby's soft head. Although she loved them with all her heart, she couldn't help her mind wandering to the unanswered questions. The murmurs and whispers of the neighborhood didn't help. Every time she left the house, she felt the inquisitive looks and heard the malicious comments. The neighbors at the grocery store talked among themselves without worrying if Nana could hear them. Have you seen Kofi's twins? I don't know how to explain it, but one of them doesn't seem to be his, said a woman, whispering but loud enough for Nana to hear. Nana took a deep breath, trying to ignore the gossip. She knew she had to be strong for her grandchildren and for Kofi. She decided to talk to her best friend, Akosua, to unburden herself. Akosua, I don't know what to do with all these rumors Nana confessed one afternoon while they had coffee in the kitchen. People keep questioning Aimee's fidelity and Kofi's paternity. Akosua, a warm-hearted woman always ready to listen, took Nana's hand. Friend, rumors are just words. You knew Ama better than anyone. 
You know she was always a woman of principles. Genetics can be strange, and those babies are your grandchildren no matter what others say. Nana nodded, feeling a bit more at ease. Thank you, Okosua. I needed to hear that. But it's hard, especially when Kofi also has doubts. Okosua looked at her with compassion. Kofi is hurt, Nana. Losing Ama, and then facing this situation is not easy for him. Give him time. In the meantime, keep giving those babies all the love you can. Nana returned home with renewed determination. Taking care of the twins became her main goal. She gave them love and attention, trying to ignore the doubts and rumors surrounding them. But every time she looked at their little faces, the questions didn't completely disappear. The neighborhood where Nana and Kofi lived was a close-knit community. Everyone knew each other and news traveled fast. The situation with the twins was no exception. Kofi and his family, once respected, now faced the critical eyes of their neighbors. Kofi headed to the mechanic's shop, but his mind was elsewhere. The worries and pain from losing Ayama, along with the doubts about his children, consumed him. Yaw, his friend and co-worker, watched him with concern. Kofi, you need to focus. You can't keep going like this, Yaw said, while adjusting a nut on an engine. Kofi sighed, running a hand through his disheveled hair. I know, Yaw. But I can't stop thinking about everything. The twins, Ama, the rumors. It's all chaos. Yaw put down his tools and approached his friend. Look, we're all here to help you. But you need to find a way to deal with this. Talk to someone, seek support. You can't keep carrying all this alone. Kofi nodded, knowing his friend was right. You're right, Yaw. I need to find a way to handle this. Meanwhile, at home, Nana faced the challenges of taking care of the twins. The babies required constant attention, and although Nana was willing to give them all her love, the fatigue was beginning to take its toll. Visits from curious neighbors and malicious comments didn't help. One afternoon, while Nana was walking with the twins in the park, she ran into Efua, a neighbor who had always been a family friend. But even Efua couldn't avoid making a comment. Nana, how are you dealing with all this? It must be difficult, especially with... Well, you know, the differences in the twins, Efua said with a forced smile. Nana kept her composure. Efua, these children are my grandchildren. I love them no matter what, and that's all that matters. Efua nodded, a bit embarrassed. You're right, Nana. I'm sorry, I just wanted. Well, you know how people are. Yes, I know Nana replied firmly. But my priority is these children. I don't care what people say. Kofi returned home that night, tired and beaten. Nana was waiting for him in the kitchen with a worried expression. Kofi, we need to talk, Nana said, serving him a cup of coffee. Kofi sat down, feeling the weight of the day. What's wrong, mom? The rumors aren't going to disappear on their own. We need to face this. Talk to a doctor, do the test you need, but don't let this consume you. Your children need you, Nana said firmly. Kofi nodded, knowing his mother was right. I will, mom. I'll do the tests. But until then, I need to focus on them and the shop. Nana smiled, taking her son's hand. That's all we can do, Kofi. One day at a time. The following days were difficult, but Kofi and Nana began to find a rhythm. The DNA tests were in process, and in the meantime, Kofi tried to be present for his children. At the shop, Yaw and the other workers supported him, covering for him when he needed time for his family. The neighborhood continued to be a place of gossip and quick judgments, but gradually, some people began to show their support. Akosua, Nana's friend, organized a neighborhood meeting to talk about the importance of community and support. We've all gone through tough times, and now is the time to come together, not Judge Akosua said during the meeting. Nana and Kofi need our support, not our whispers behind their backs. Akosua's message resonated with some, and the neighborhood's attitude began to change slowly. However, Kofi felt trapped in an endless cycle of pain and confusion. Every passing day, doubts about the paternity of the twins mingled with the unbearable pain of losing Ama. Sitting at the kitchen table, he stared at his cup of cold coffee, feeling the weight of the situation crushing him. One afternoon, after returning from the workshop, he found Nana in the living room, rocking the twins to sleep. Kofi stopped at the door, watching them, his children. The doubt persisted, fueled by the pain and neighborhood gossip. Mom, I can't go on like this, Kofi said, his voice barely a whisper. 
I need to get out of here. I need time to think. Nana looked at him with concern. Kofi, you can't leave your children. They need you now more than ever. Kofi shook his head, feeling a mix of guilt and desperation. I can't do this, mom. Not while I have so many doubts and so much pain. I'm no good for them like this. Nana sighed, understanding her son's torment but knowing she couldn't force him to stay. What are you planning to do, Kofi? I've decided to go to the grandparents' house in the distant city. I need to be alone, away from all this. For a while Kofi replied with a tone that was both determined and sad. Nana nodded slowly. I understand that you need time, but please promise me you'll come back. These children need their father. I'll come back, Mom. I just need some time to clear my mind. Thank you for everything Kofi said, hugging his mother tightly. That same night, Kofi packed a few things and said goodbye to Nana and the twins. As he drove towards his grandparents' abandoned house, he felt a mix of relief and sadness. Upon arrival, the house was just as he remembered it old, dusty, and full of memories. Kofi settled into one of the less deteriorated rooms. For the first few days he tried to keep his mind occupied with small repairs around the house, but the pain and loneliness soon became unbearable. Drinking became his escape. Every night, he sat on the porch with a bottle of cheap liquor, remembering Ama the laughter, the shared dreams, and finally, the tragedy of her death. He felt overwhelmed by guilt and doubts. What if the twins weren't his? What if Ama had hidden something from him? But also, what if they were his children? The uncertainty was eating him up inside. Kofi found himself alone in his grandparents' house, the place that had been his refuge for almost a year. The night was dark and silent, interrupted only by the sound of his ragged breathing and the occasional creaking of the old wood. He had lost count of the empty bottles surrounding him, silent witnesses to his nights of pain and self-pity. That night, Kofi decided to set the drink aside for a moment and let his memories wash over him. He closed his eyes and saw Ama, like the first time he met her. Her contagious laughter and vibrant energy filled the room. He remembered how he felt when he saw her for the first time, the instant spark that made him know she would be someone special in his life. Do you remember that day, Emma? Kofi murmured, his words barely audible. We met in the park, right? You were picking flowers for a university project and I was fixing a bike. He remembered their first date a simple dinner but full of laughter and deep conversations. Then the wedding a modest event but overflowing with love. Alma looked radiant in her white dress, and Kofi couldn't take his eyes off her. The plans for the future were grand and hopeful. They wanted to start a family, have children, and build a life together. When Ama got pregnant, Kofi thought his dreams were coming true. But everything fell apart on the day of the birth. Kofi felt the tears rolling down his face as he emptied another bottle of liquor. I'm sorry, Ama. I haven't been the man you needed. I haven't been the father our children deserve. The front door creaked, and Kofi looked up, surprised by the unexpected visit. Yaw, Kofi's best friend and co-worker, walked in, his expression a mix of determination and concern. Kofi, I can't watch you keep doing this to yourself, Yaw said, closing the door behind him. I can't stand by while you destroy yourself. Kofi sighed and ran a hand over his face, trying to clear his head. Yaw, you don't know how hard it is. Every time I think about Ama, I feel crushed by guilt and doubt. Yaw sat down across from him, looking directly into his eyes. Yes, I do. It's not easy, but you have to remember who Ama was. She was strong, faithful, and she loved you with all her heart. She trusted you to take care of those children. But what if they're not mine, Yaw? Kofi's voice trembled. What if it was all a lie? Yaw shook his head. Ama wasn't like that. You need to find out the truth. Do the DNA test if that's what it takes to calm your doubts. But you can't keep running away. You can't keep hiding and drowning in drink. Kofi looked at his friend, feeling Yaw's words resonate deep within him. What if I can't handle the truth? Then we'll deal with it together. But not knowing is destroying you, Kofi, and you can't keep distancing yourself from your children and your life, Yaw said firmly but with a tone of understanding. Kofi nodded slowly, feeling the small spark of hope ignite within him. You're right, Yaw. I can't keep going like this. I need to know the truth. Yaw smiled slightly, pleased to see his friend taking a step forward. Good, 
I'll help you do whatever it takes. The decision was made. The next day, Kofi and Yaw arranged an appointment for the DNA tests. Kofi felt a mix of fear and relief. He was finally going to face his fears and doubts instead of running from them. When Yaw left that night, Kofi stayed alone in the house, but this time with a different feeling. He approached a photo of Ama and the twins that he had placed on the table. He took the photo and looked at it closely. Ama, I'm so sorry. But I promise I'm going to make things right for you and for our children he whispered as tears fell again. But this time with renewed determination. After Yaw's visit and scheduling the DNA test for two weeks later, Kofi was determined to return home and face the truth. He felt a mix of nervousness and determination as he climbed to the attic to find a suitcase to pack his things. The attic was full of dust and forgotten memories, a reflection of the feelings Kofi had tried to bury for so long. As he scanned the place, something caught his attention an old, dusty suitcase in a corner. It seemed to have been there for decades. Kofi approached it, and upon picking it up, he felt it was surprisingly heavy. Curiosity overtook him. He needed a tool to open the rusty lock that kept the suitcase shut. He searched the attic and found a small crowbar that seemed suitable for the task. After several attempts and with some effort, the lock gave way, and Kofi opened the suitcase. What he found inside left him speechless. There were letters, photographs, and a small chest. He started to look through the photos first. What he saw surprised him his grandfather as a teenager, alongside a light-skinned woman, and a dark-skinned man. Kofi had never heard about his great-grandparents in detail. He only vaguely remembered his grandfather saying they were good people. Kofi sat on the attic floor with the photos spread around him, trying to process what he was seeing. He picked up one of the letters and began to read it. It was a letter written by his great-grandfather to his great-grandmother. It described their life, their love, and the challenges they faced due to their interracial marriage in a time when that was extremely difficult. Dear Helena, the letter began, These times are hard, but your love gives me the strength to carry on. Our children must know that our love overcame all barriers and that family is the most important thing. Kofi felt tears welling up in his eyes. His family's history was more complex and rich than he had ever imagined. He continued reading several letters, each one filling in pieces of the puzzle of his heritage. In the small chest, Kofi found more photographs and a few personal items such as an old watch and a pendant. Everything indicated that his great-grandparents had been strong and brave people who had faced great challenges for their love. This made him think of Ama and how his love for her was just as strong, despite all the doubts and problems. With a new understanding and a sense of connection to his past, Kofi decided he needed to share this discovery with his mother, Nana, and possibly with the twins when they were older. He carefully gathered the letters and photographs and stored them in the suitcase. He came down from the attic with the suitcase and called Nana. Mom, I found something in the grandparents' attic that you need to see, he said, trying to keep calm in his voice. They are photos and letters from our great-grandparents. I never knew that Grandpa was the son of an interracial couple. There was a long silence on the line before Nana responded, her voice trembling slightly. Kofi, that is. I don't know what to say. Grandpa was always very reserved about his family. He promised never to speak of the past to protect us. He wanted us to live without prejudice. But mom, this changes everything. We need to know our history. I need to know it, especially now Kofi insisted. I know son, I know. I promise we'll talk more about this when you come back. But please come back soon. We need you here. Nana responded with a mix of sadness and hope in her voice. I'll come back mom. I promise Kofi said with renewed determination. Kofi spent the rest of the day packing his things and reflecting on what he had discovered. The photos and letters seemed to be a key to understanding more about himself and his children. That night, instead of turning to drink, he sat with the letters, reading about the lives of his great-grandparents, their forbidden love, and the struggles they faced. The next day, with the suitcase full of memories and revelations, Kofi set off on the journey back home. As he drove, he thought about how he would share these discoveries with his mother, and how this might change the way he viewed his own children. He knew it wouldn't be easy, but he was determined to face the past to build a better future for his family. When he arrived home, Nana greeted him with a strong hug. 
We missed you so much, Kofi she said with tears in her eyes. I missed you too, mom. And I have so much to tell you Kofi responded with a mix of excitement and nervousness. They sat in the living room, and Kofi began to take out the photos and letters from the suitcase. Nana took them carefully, reading and looking at each image attentively. I can't believe Grandpa never told us this Nana said, her voice breaking. Maybe he thought he was protecting us Kofi suggested. After the conversation with his mother Kofi went upstairs to the twins' room, his heart pounding. It had been a long and painful journey to reach this moment. As he opened the door, he saw the twins awake in their cribs, playing with their little hands and feet. Both children turned to look at him, their eyes big and curious. He approached slowly, observing them closely. Kofi couldn't help but notice the details he had previously overlooked the way they smiled, so much like Ama, and the little gestures they made, reminding him of her. He knelt to be at their level, and one of the twins reached out to him. Hello, little ones, Kofi said, his voice soft but full of emotion. I'm daddy. One of the twins, the one with lighter skin, smiled and babbled something unintelligible, while the other twin, with darker skin, looked at him with a mix of curiosity and shyness. Kofi noticed a small mole on the neck of the second twin, exactly in the same spot where he had one too. It's incredible, Kofi murmured feeling a deep and real connection. You're part of me, of Ama. The following days were crucial. The day after his arrival, Kofi and Nana took the twins to the hospital to perform the DNA test. The wait for the results was tense, but Kofi knew he needed to know the truth to move forward. A week later, he received a call from the lab. With trembling hands, he answered the phone. Mr. Kofi, we have the results of the DNA test. The twins are your biological children said the voice on the other end of the line. Kofi felt a mix of relief and regret. He had wasted so much time in doubt and pain. He hung up the phone and stood in silence for a moment, processing the news. Then he went straight to the twins' room. They're mine, Kofi said, with tears in his eyes, looking at Nana, who was playing with the children. They're my children, Nana smiled, with tears of joy in her own eyes. I always knew it, Kofi. Now it's time for you to be the father they need. Kofi moved back in with Nana, determined to reconnect with his children. He spent hours playing with them, caring for them, and learning every little detail of their personalities. The twins, though shy at first, began to accept their father, laughing and babbling as he talked to them. A few days later, Kofi decided to take the twins to Aima's grave. It was a visit he had been putting off, but he knew it was necessary to close one chapter and begin another. They arrived at the cemetery on a sunny morning. Kofi carried one of the twins while Nana held the other. They approached Ama's grave and Kofi knelt in front of the headstone, placing a hand on the cold stone. Hey Ma, we're here Kofi said, his voice breaking. I wanted you to meet our children. They are beautiful, and I promise I will take care of them. I will honor your memory and be the father they deserve. Tears rolled down his cheeks as he watched the twins playing with the flowers by the grave. Nana placed a hand on Kofi's shoulder, offering silent support. Kofi took a deep breath, feeling a large part of the weight he had been carrying lift. I miss you every day, Amma, but I promise the children will know who you are and how much you loved them. They stayed a while longer at the cemetery, enjoying the tranquility and the sense of closure. Kofi felt a peace he hadn't felt in a long time. He knew there was still much to do, but for the first time he felt ready to face the future. They returned home, and Kofi continued dedicating himself to his children. Each day was a new challenge, but also an opportunity to build a strong and loving relationship with the twins. As time passed, he became a constant and caring figure in their lives, sharing laughter, games and special moments. The years passed quickly, and the twins, now six years old, were ready to start school. Kofi and Nana had worked hard to provide a loving and stable home, but they knew the challenges were just beginning. The first week of school was difficult. Despite their enthusiasm, the twins encountered classmates who didn't understand why two brothers could have such different skin colors. At recess, some children approached them with curious looks and cruel comments. Why do you look so different from your brother? A boy asked his tone full of suspicion. 
The lighter-skinned twin Kwame looked at his brother Kojo and then responded firmly. Because we're special. We're brothers, and that's all that matters. Kojo nodded, feeling his brother's support, but the children's words were hurtful and hard to ignore. When they got home, Kofi noticed something was wrong. The twins, usually full of energy and laughter, were quiet and downcast. What happened at school today? Kofi asked, kneeling in front of them. Kwame and Kojo exchanged looks before Kwame spoke. Some kids said bad things. They said we shouldn't be brothers because we look different. Kofi felt a knot in his stomach. That's not right. You are brothers, and you are perfect just as you are. We'll figure this out. That night, Kofi and Nana discussed the situation. They decided to speak with the school principal, Mrs. Bako, to find a way to educate the students and teachers about diversity and acceptance. The next day, Kofi and Nana met with the principal in her office. Mrs. Bako greeted them with a sympathetic smile. I understand your concern, Mrs. Bako said. It's important that all children feel accepted and safe at school. We can organize workshops and activities to educate the students about diversity. Kofi nodded, feeling relieved. Thank you. It's crucial that the twins feel they belong here. We want them to know that being different is something to celebrate. Mrs. Bako coordinated a series of workshops and talks on diversity and acceptance. They invited experts and organized activities where the children could learn and discuss the importance of respecting differences. The twins also participated, sharing their own story and helping their classmates better understand their situation. Over time, the atmosphere at the school began to change. The children who had been cruel started to show curiosity and respect towards the twins. Kwame and Kojo became advocates for diversity, gaining friends and allies in the process. But the challenges did not end there. Upon entering high school, the twins faced a new set of difficulties. Adolescence brought with it greater pressure and new prejudices. Some classmates still wouldn't accept their differences, and the hurtful comments resurfaced. One afternoon, after a particularly tough day, Kwame and Kojo sat in the living room, their faces reflecting the frustration and sadness they felt. Why can't people just accept us for who we are? Kojo asked, his voice full of desperation. Kwame nodded. It's exhausting having to fight all the time just for being who we are. Kofi, listening from the kitchen, joined them sitting beside them. I know it's hard, guys, but every time you face these challenges, you are making a difference. You are teaching people to be better, to be more open and understanding. Nana, who had been listening, came over and hugged the twins. You have the power to change things and you're not alone in this. We're here to support you always. That night, the twins talked about their dreams and aspirations. They decided they wanted to study law when they grew up. They wanted to fight against injustice and prejudice, not just for themselves, but for everyone who faces discrimination. I want to be a lawyer and help people understand that we are all equal," Kwame said, determination in his voice. Me too added Kojo. I want to make a difference so that no one else has to go through what we did. Kofi and Nana felt a mix of pride and emotion. They knew the brothers had the strength and determination to make a real change in the world. We are so proud of you said Kofi, hugging them. And we know you're going to achieve great things. It was a hot afternoon at Kofi's workshop. The constant sound of tools and the smell of grease and metal filled the air. Kofi was focused on repairing an engine when he heard the door open, and a female voice called out. Kofi the woman said curiously. Kofi looked up, wiping his hands on a dirty rag. In front of him stood Zola, an investigative journalist who had heard about his story and wanted to learn more. I'm Zola, a journalist from El Diario Nacional. I've heard about your story, and would like to know more. I think it could inspire a lot of people," Zola said, extending her hand. Kofi shook it, a bit puzzled. Zola, it's a pleasure, but I don't know what could interest you so much about my life. Zola smiled. I've heard about your twins and how you discovered your origins. I want to tell that story. I think it can have a big impact. Kofi sighed and nodded. I understand. It's a long and complicated story. It all started when I found old letters and photographs of my great-grandfather. He was a dark-skinned man who married a light-skinned woman at a time when that was extremely difficult. 
They faced a lot of racism and challenges. But their love was strong. Zola took out a notebook and pen. I'd love to hear more. Do you have time to talk? Kofi nodded, and they sat in a corner of the workshop. As he narrated the story, Zola took detailed notes. He spoke about finding the letters and photographs, how that led him to better understand his roots, and how it influenced the way he saw his children and his own life. That's an incredible story, Kofi Zola said as she finished taking notes. I think many people could be inspired by it. Have you ever considered writing a book about this? Kofi shook his head. I never thought about it. I'm not a writer. Zola looked at him with determination. You don't need to be. You can tell your story and I'll help you with the rest. The world needs to hear this. Kofi thought for a moment. The idea of sharing his story with the world was intimidating, but he also felt it could make a difference. All right, Zola, let's do it. I want people to know about my family and everything we've overcome. Over the following months, Kofi and Zola worked together on the book. Kofi spent his nights remembering and writing, while Zola helped him structure and shape the narrative. It was an exhausting but also therapeutic process. Kofi felt that by telling his story, he was honoring the memory of Ama and his ancestors. Finally, the book was ready. They titled it Roots of Valor. Kofi felt nervous when the publication day arrived. He didn't know how people would react, but he was proud to have done it. The reaction was overwhelming. The book quickly became a bestseller. Receiving praise for its honesty and message of hope and perseverance. Kofi's story and his family's story resonated with many people who also faced prejudice and challenges. One night, Kofi was at home with Nana and the twins, now teenagers. They were all sitting in the living room. Going through the comments and reviews of the book, Kwame, with a smile on his face, looked at his father. Dad, this book is changing a lot of people's lives. I'm very proud of you. Kojo nodded. You've shown us what it means to be strong and brave. We want to follow in your footsteps. Kofi felt moved. Thank you guys. This book is as much yours as it is mine. We've all been through a lot, and seeing how our story can help others is incredible. Nana, with tears of pride in her eyes, added, Your grandfather and great-grandparents would be so proud of you, Kofi. You've honored their memory in the best possible way. Kofi felt a deep peace and satisfaction. With the book's success, Kofi began receiving invitations to speak at schools, communities and events about his story. Every time he told his story, he felt like he was building a bridge between the past and the present, inspiring others to overcome their own challenges. Kofi was nervous as he finished preparing dinner at his house. He had invited Zola over to thank her for helping him tell his story to the world. As he set the table, he couldn't help but think about how much they had achieved together. Since the book's publication, his life had taken an unexpected but gratifying turn. When the doorbell rang, Kofi opened the door to find Zola smiling, holding a bottle of wine. Hi Kofi. Thanks for inviting me, she said, stepping into the house. Thank you for coming, Kofi replied, taking the bottle. We'll have dinner in the living room. I hope you like the food. They sat down and began talking about the book, their lives, and their children. Zola, who was divorced and the mother of a teenager, shared her own experiences and challenges. I've always admired how you've handled everything, Kofi. You're an inspiration, Zola said, her eyes shining with sincerity. Kofi smiled, feeling a warmth he hadn't felt in a long time. You're an inspiration too, Zola. Without you, I wouldn't have been able to tell my story this way. The conversation flowed easily, and as the night went on, the mutual interest became evident. Zola and Kofi found themselves laughing and sharing personal anecdotes, feeling more connected with each passing moment. Days passed, and the two continued to meet, enjoying each other's company. What started as a professional friendship quickly developed into something deeper. A few months later, they were officially dating. Nana and the twins supported Kofi's relationship with Zola. Dad, Zola is great. We're glad to see you happy Kwame said one afternoon while they played in the yard. Yes, Dad. Zola is an amazing person, added Kojo, nodding enthusiastically. Nana also expressed her approval. Kofi, Zola is a wonderful woman. I'm glad to see you found someone to share your life with. Years passed, and the twins managed to get into law school, 
fulfilling their dream of fighting against discrimination and injustice. The day of their graduation was an emotional event for the whole family. Kwame M and Kojo, dressed in caps and gowns, took the stage to give their speech. The crowd fell silent as Kwame began to speak. Today is a special day for all of us. We've worked hard to get here, and we couldn't have done it without the support of our families Kwame's Kwame N, looking at his father, Zola, and Nana in the audience. We have faced many challenges because of our differences, but those experiences have strengthened us and given us a mission. Kojo continued, we want to dedicate our lives to fighting discrimination and promoting acceptance of differences. The twins' words resonated throughout the room, and many in the audience were moved to tears. Kofi, Zola, and Nana felt deeply proud and emotional. They've made it, Nana whispered, tears in her eyes. Yes, mom, they've made it, Kofi replied, squeezing Zola's hand. Once graduated, the twins opened their own law office in the community where they grew up. From day one, they committed to supporting the local population against injustice. Their primary fight was against discrimination and racism, using their own experiences as motivation. The first case they took on was that of an immigrant family who had been unjustly evicted from their home. Kwame and Kojo worked tirelessly, presenting evidence and arguing in the family's defense. They won the case, which not only secured justice for the family but also established their reputation in the community. We are here to help everyone, regardless of their origin or appearance Kwame said during an interview with the local press. Our goal is to create a place where everyone feels accepted and valued. Kojo added, we know what it's like to be judged for being different. We want to ensure that no one else has to go through that. Kofi, Zola and Nana watched with pride as the twins transformed their community. They knew the journey had been long and full of challenges, but they also knew that each obstacle had strengthened their determination. One day, while they were all gathered in the twins' office, Kojo turned to Kofi. Dad, everything we've achieved is thanks to you. You showed us how to be strong and resilient. And thanks to you too, Zola added Kwame. You helped us understand the importance of telling our story. Kofi smiled, moved. I am incredibly proud of you. You have turned our struggles into a force for good. Keep doing what you're doing, and you will change the world. With the support of their family, friends, and community, Kofi saw a bright future for his twins. He knew that despite the challenges, love and unity could overcome any obstacle. Kofi's family had become an example of resilience and strength, inspiring others in the neighborhood and beyond. Hey everyone, the story of Kofi Ayama and their children is a powerful reminder that even in the face of the toughest challenges, love and resilience can guide us to overcome. Discrimination and prejudice are harsh realities, but together we can turn these into strengths that drive us to build a better, more inclusive world. This family's journey shows us that our differences are our greatest strength and that through unity and understanding, we can conquer any obstacle. Let this story inspire each of us to fight against injustice and to promote acceptance and respect in our communities. We'd love to hear what you thought of the story. Your feedback is crucial for us to keep bringing you more impactful and heartwarming tales. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any updates. Take care and see you in the next story.